Okay, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me and um, happy birthday, birthday to WIDA. It's a great privilege to be here. Uh, when Tony asked me to speak about this, he asked me to um, infuse the younger generation of economists for working on trade. He felt that perhaps we hadn't been uh, doing enough uh, recently. Um, I've got 10 minutes to do that. There's a little bit more than 10 minutes worth. Um, but anyway, we will uh, uh, do what we can. So, uh, just uh, uh, to start with a few preliminaries, I'm taking a view of trade and development through the growth lens. I certainly don't want to get into arguments about whether growth is the only thing uh, that development entails, but it's clearly one of the things that development entails, and it has been over the last 30 years one of the major uh, considerations of the sort of trade and development debate. I mean, intuitively, we think that trade is likely to influence growth. And if you want sort of to prove this to yourself, imagine a village perfectly in autarky, not trading with anyone, anywhere. It would not likely grow very fast. And so, in some sense, uh, just a priori, it's an issue that we ought to be thinking about. I think the evidence over the last 30 years is that, in fact, there's a positive relationship between uh, trade and growth. I'll talk a bit about that. And... Uh, one of the interesting dimensions of this is that at least one element of what determines trade is cheap and easy to change, at least economically, technically, and that's trade policy. There are lots of expensive things you can do to uh, boost trade, trade facilitation and all of that sort of thing, but one of them, and this is always worth remembering, I think, only takes the minister to change a number in a column and you have a trade liberalization. And so it's an interesting question to ask, are we foregoing something very simple uh, that might boost the incomes of countries and uh, hopefully therefore of uh, poor people? Uh, why trade is perfectly simple. Um, uh, relationship, uh, the first equation on this, net exports, the difference between production and consumption. The point about trade is it allows you to consume and produce different bundles of goods or goods and services. So that allows specialization, comparative advantage. It allows you to bring inputs into your production processes um, from abroad. It allows competitive pressures uh, because one's engaging with people who are uh, producing much further away. And also in terms of growth, it allows the following macroeconomic observation. The government seeking to grow can focus on their production side without worrying about whether consumption, the demand for the goods that are going to be produced by the growing sectors, are going to be demanded within the local economy. When Britain industrialized as the only supplier of uh, industrial goods, uh, mid 18th century, it took Britain over 100 years to double its income per head. Essentially, and you think about our theories of development, which refer back to the role of agriculture as generating incomes to spend on industrial goods, demand and supply had to go up more or less together. There was no other market other than the industrial market in Britain. When China was developing in the last 30 years, it took China 13 years to, develop, to uh, double its income. Why was that? Because China could produce lots, sell it abroad without driving the price down. Uh, in other words, trade by breaking the production consumption link allows you, in a sense, to do things that were quite impossible in an autarkic economy. Uh, just a very brief word. I had expected to speak more about this sort of theory. There are two ways we can think about the relationship between, I've called it openness, O, and income, Y. One is the levels relationship, that the relationship runs from openness to the level of income. The other is a growth relationship, that openness affects the growth rate per se. And uh, it's theoretically interesting, anyway, to ask which of these uh, applies. I will make a comment about its empirics in a second. The theory is actually quite a live area at the moment. There's quite a number of uh, recent uh, papers uh, thinking about the way that um, uh, trade and growth might interact. And indeed, um, a number of scholars are reviving more or less the neoclassical growth model with trade, looking at the way that trade affects accumulation, uh, looking at the way it determines uh, technological efficiency. The other sort of model that is uh, used are essentially multi-sectoral models, 
where we've got questions about are you in the right sector, sort of structuralist schools. There's the question about having a sector which actually undertakes innovation as a conscious process. And that raises really quite important issues for growth because the innovation sector will compete with other sectors for resources. And when it's opened up to the world, it has the world, it has a much larger scale, so it can sell great innovations around the whole world, but it also faces more competition. And the first of those tends to increase growth, uh, the second to decrease it. So there is actually quite a lot of interesting theory. But the overriding outcome of the theory is it's ambiguous, we don't know. And so, in a sense, it is, as Danny Roderick has said for 20 years, actually just an empirical issue. I was going to do a little illustration of the difficulties of doing empirical work according to whether the relationship is a levels or a growth relationship. It really matters very much. But let me actually just sort of skip through this slide. We can think that an openness, a trade liberalization, raises the growth path or makes the growth path steeper. And you might think that if, we're th if we've got a horizon of 50 or 100 years, it really matters if you're taking a step up or you're changing the growth rate even by a small amount. But given that changing the level of growth takes some time to adjust, we're going to have some path up to the new growth path, like the dotted line, the broken line there. And if you've only got observations, real data, that sort of span the period over which that adjustment might be taken, empirically, we are not going to be able to tell these apart. And the literature is extremely casual about which of these models it's working with. And we are, frankly, I think, completely unclear which of them applies. OK, I want to make three points, really, about the empirics. Uh, first, it seems to me that we've had immense debate about causation. Uh, Danny Roderick um, and Rodriguez really debunked all the literature up uh, till about the mid-1990s. Since then, we thought we'd done better by instrumenting trade and putting it into growth equations. Uh, but very recent work by Sam Bassey and Michael Clemens, at least in my mind, has really thrown all of that up into the air. And the important thing about instrumental variables, if you're using it, is you want to be sure that the instrument can own, if you're trying to do a trade on growth rela uh, relationship, you want to be sure that the instrumental variable that you've got can only affect growth through its influence on trade. The big problem with the way that we started to instrument trade with a gravity model was it relied very heavily on country size. And we can all think of dozens of relationships out there in the literature, in the respectable literature, which relate country size to other things like FDI, innovation, education, and so on, which then feed into growth. So the point really is if you want to use a sort of a uh, gravity model to instrument your trade to go into a growth equation, you have to say all that stuff about country size and foreign direct investment, country size and education, it's worth nothing, trade's the only link. You don't want to say that. So in fact, it seems to me, we've taken quite a step back or we've realized we were wrong in the last few years. One major challenge for the future, getting causation. Causation is very important if you want to do policy. You can't do policy unless you've got causation. And so I think that is one of the big challenges. <clears throat> Let me say, however, that even if you can't do causation, you might still find that trade has a very strong permissive effect. The incentives, to think about the splitting up production and consumption, as we grow for some other reason, we might still have um, disequilibria between consumption and production, and trade is necessary to allow, as it were, that to happen. So even if we can't do causation, there are some useful things we can do, um, but causation is important for policy. Um, let me skip through other instruments that we might use. A second point to make is, in a sense, it's uh, just a great arrogance to say there's only one model. But clearly, all our experience suggests there's some heterogeneity about the way that trade interacts with the growth process or indeed any other process. And there's some suggestion that low-income countries maybe have gained less from their trade liberalizations, that Africa has gained less. Uh, my own view is that that's still an open question. I'm not going to say anything more about it now, but it seems to me the second big frontier that we really do need to be thinking about is under what circumstances is trade or possibly trade liberalization going to help the growth issue? 
Now, what does it mean for policy? As scientists, as academics, we test hypotheses. And unless we're, uh, unless we're really certain, um, you know, 5% significance test, unless we're certain with 90% confidence that what we found could not have arisen by chance, we say we haven't found it. The policymaker's problem is different. The policymaker has to decide. He has to decide tomorrow. And therefore, he's going to be interested not just in a 5% significance test, but he's going to be interested in things like what's the balance of evidence from some bits of research, from common sense, from what have you. What's the whole possible distribution of outcomes? What are the costs of being wrong at one end, wrong at the other? And uh, what's the cost of uncertainty per se? So the policymaker has a different approach to this problem as the academic. And it's something which, frankly, the academics have not realized and taken, I think, sufficient attention of. And just to illustrate this, this is a little study that looked at the increment that trade liberalizations uh, applied to the growth rate of countries and um, runs from uh, lower than minus two, growth got worse after a trade liberalization, up to, well, more than uh, plus eight. The, if we take a simple mean of uh, those growth increments in 47 instances, the mean is not significantly different from zero. As academics, you would say, growth ha uh, trade has no effect or trade liberalization has no effect on growth. But if you were a policymaker, you really would want to see the whole of that distribution. You would want to observe that there are twice as many observations on the right of the red line of zero than on the left. You would want to observe that there are some very big positives and there are some negatives. You'd have to decide how much the negatives upset you. So when we're doing policy, it seems to me, third point, we ought to be doing a rather different job as academics. The last point, Valp, you'll be here to say, pleased to say, is one of the really big strong results that we get from almost all the empirics is that trade liberalizations seem to be associated with increasing productivity. And ultimately, we're interested in increasing productivity because that's the basis of higher incomes. There are reservations uh, that we get from sort of the uh, structural change analysis that you may have very efficient sectors but have everybody in the wrong sectors and certainly in the medium term that is something that we need to be conscious of but in the end we live better now than we did 200 years ago because we're more productive. There are several possible mechanisms, don't want to talk about this uh, in great detail, but we know we can have competition and selectivity models, we know that imported inputs and liberalization of imported inputs seems to be hugely important, and uh, we also have a, a, an active debate still going on about whether one really learns by exporting, learns from the people you're dealing with. Uh, the point to make to scholars looking forward is the last 10 years have seen a huge growth in our ability to use le uh, firm level data. We now have much better data on firms. Firms are where productivity occurs. And increasingly, in a number of countries, we're now able to match those firm level data with international trade data from the customs authorities. So there's a whole field out there of trying to plot down exactly which bits of liberalization, exactly which bits of trade generate the shocks that move through to firms increasing productivity. For sure, you need to worry about the structural change, but ultimately, we do need to think about increasing productivity. So the fourth point I want to make is, it seems to me there's an immense amount of work to be done uh, going forward on uh, productivity. <clears throat> and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.